Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Institute for Government. I'm Ian McGee, I'm the senior fellow here. Uh, civil service reform, as we all know in this room, is a hot topic at the moment. Uh, one important aspect that has caught the headlines in the last few days is the business that you're all here for today, the appointment of permanent secretaries. At the Institute, we've been yeah. interviewing a number yeah. of people about the appointments process, and we shall produce a short paper probably towards the end of of February on this, which also encapsulates that which comes out of today's uh, seminar. But this is part of a, a wider year-long study into accountability that the Institute is, is carrying out. Uh, necessarily, since it's such a wide subject, we're doing it all sequentially. Um, but look, let's get on with today and today's business quickly. Let me make a few introductions and say a little about the running order. Uh, on in the middle there is David Norlington. David is the first civil service commissioner and also the first to be this as well, the commissioner for public appointments. Um, David's going to s explain how the system currently works, which seems like quite a good starting point given some of the stuff that's been flying around recently. Uh, he will also, though, set out what the commission's view is, um, and that I think will be helpful. Each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes or, or thereabouts. Secondly, Carolyn Spellman. Um, Carolyn, until uh, recently, was the Secretary of State at, uh, at, at DEFRA and was involved in an appointments process in the course of that time with the person who is currently the DEFRA Permanent Secretary. Uh, and Caroline tells me that she was, her views were accurately reported in the Times this morning, for those of you who've seen the Times, but she'll no doubt elaborate herself on, on that. Uh, and our third speaker, offering a different perspective again, is Ian Davis. Ian, for many years, the managing <coughs> partner at McKinsey, and uh, having worked for McKinsey for many years, now has an interesting and eclectic portfolio, <coughs> what element of which is his role as a non-executive director in a cabinet office. So again, there is some relevance and some currency to Ian's potential contribution, but you'll be the judges of all of that as far as all our speakers are concerned. Uh, one thing to say is that this is a public uh, debate, so uh, anything you say may be reported on, uh, but not used in evidence against you, I hope. Uh, and I'm full of hope that we will have a very good discussion, which may amount to more, certainly I hope it does, than just an exchange of questions. You'll have plenty of opportunity to ask your questions, but let's see whether we can bring some themes out when the time comes to do so. Without further ado, please welcome David Norlington to give the first contribution. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you and hello, everybody. Um, and thank you to the Institute for giving us this opportunity uh, because I don't feel I have had a chance yet to explain the Civil Service Commission's position, um, and that's what I want to do in the next 10 minutes. Why we think ministers should have a significant role in senior civil service appointments, but why we stop short of giving ministers the final choice. Now, um, let's start with a couple of facts. Last summer in the Civil Service Reform Plan, the government made two propositions, you may remember, <laughs> for strengthening the role of ministers in senior civil service appointments. The first proposition, which was actually not in the <coughs> plan itself, but was explained in this way on the day, um, would give a Secretary of State a choice of candidates for permanent secretary appointments from a list approved by an appointments panel. The second would allow for ministers to request short-term time-limited appointments to meet urgent business needs without the need for a competition. Now, I'm going to concentrate my remarks on the first of these, the issue of ministerial choice, because actually the second is already possible and happens under the civil service's current procedures. I know, though, some people are not very happy with that second proposition, so if people want to draw me out a bit on that, um, I'm happy to do so later. I do want to say by way of opening, however, that I and my colleagues on the Civil Service Commission do rather regret the way the debate has developed since the government put these proposals on the table. Although in themselves they're quite limited in their immediate effect, 
they've opened up a much wider questioning of whether the present model of a UK civil service, politically impartial, recruited on merit through fair and open competition, is still valid. Now, as you would expect, the Commission is totally opposed to any step towards politicisation. We were established to defend the principles of merit and impartiality. We were given new powers in 2010 by Parliament to enable us to do that. So please don't be surprised if we remain the most vigorous proponents of the principles of merit and impartiality and push back at steps which seem to threaten them. That's what we were put there to do. The trouble is I think this is the wrong debate at the wrong time. If the real aim is to create the best possible civil service to tackle the immense economic, social and security challenges of now, of 2015, of 2020, then the emphasis must, in the Commission's view, be on improving the skills, the experience, the competence of those who are already civil servants and those we are seeking to attract and recruit into the civil service. Whether ministers have choice has little to do with that. Wider politicisation has even less. So as a commission, we would really like to spend our time shaping that debate about skills. We're not part of the civil service despite our name, so we can bring external challenge and perspective. I'm the only um, one of the commissioners, 11 commissioners, with a significant civil service background. All the rest are drawn from the public, the um, third and the private sector. In fact, the majority, the slight majority, have private sector backgrounds. Our whole purpose in the Commission is to get the best people into jobs at all levels in the civil service, particularly at the top. As the law says, quotes, on merit, on the basis of fair and open competition. That's not some outdated principle. Getting the best people into the civil service is, we think, hope you'll agree, a principle for all times. It's our role in chairing the most senior competitions, well over 100 this year, actually near 130, which gives us a unique view right across the civil service of what is and is not working. And our role has grown as more and more senior jobs are opened up to public um, competition. 20, even 10 years ago, it would have been unusual to open permanent secretary appointments to external competition. Now it is the norm. And when that happens, such appointments must, by law, be on merit after a fair and open competition. From our vantage point, we don't see a civil service which is a closed shop or resistant to change. Over the last five years, for example, we've chaired precisely 372 open competitions for the posts at the top three levels of the civil service, and 49% of them, half, uh, have been won by non-civil servants. And the majority of those have come from the private sector. We don't argue that the answer to all the civil services problems is to recruit at senior levels from outside. On the contrary, the best, and that's what we're after, should come through a mix of internal development and external recruitment as the need arises. But when there is external competition, we want it to be more professional and evidence-based. We want to see less process for its own sake and more sustained involvement in selection from senior managers. We don't think enough attention has yet been given to defining the skills the civil service needs for the future, particularly at the top. We're concerned about the lack of flexibility on pay and the generally negative picture of relations at the top, which we don't think are wholly true between ministers and civil servants, which we fear will put people are of talent off from applying. We're open to any new ideas for identifying and recruiting new talent and for injecting new skills. Um, with one proviso, we're totally against using that as a cover for bringing in more political appointees of either civil servant uh, or cronies of either civil servants or politicians. These are the issues that we think really matter in transforming the civil service. Some are in the civil service reform plan and we welcome them. The danger is that in the current debate, those issues will not be addressed with the urgency and single-minded focus that is needed. 
Let me turn to the specific question of ministerial involvement in senior appointments. Um, the Commission is keen that ministers play an important role in the selection of the most senior civil servants, and we continue to evolve our practice to encourage them to do so. If that role is played actively, ministers can be a powerful and positive force for changing the skills and experience of a future civil service. In the case of permanent secretaries, we accept that there's a particular need for substantial ministerial involvement in those appointments. After all, they work so closely with those people. And that's why just before Christmas, and in response to the civil service reform plan, we published a detailed note on how ministers should be involved in permanent secretary appointments. And that note's on our website, but one of my colleagues has, those colleagues there, has copies of that if you'd like to look at it later. This note goes further than the Commission has ever gone in explicitly recognizing the central role that a Secretary of State must play. Far from being held at arm's length, Secretaries of State can and should agree what the job is and what skills and experience are needed, how it is to be filled, for example, through internal or external competition, who should be on the selection panel. They should and usually do meet the shortlisted candidates, and this is for far more than a briefing, and having met the candidates, the Secretary of State feeds back to the selection panel on the strengths and weaknesses of the candidates and the issues he or she wants pursued in final interview. But the sele selection panel must recommend the single most suitable candidate for appointment, and at that final stage, there is no ministerial choice. But even then, the law gives the final power to appoint to the Prime Minister, who therefore can veto the recommended candidate, and that's a power which he exercised in the recent case of the Permanent Secretary at DEC. <coughs> this is a lot of involvement and influence, much more than would have been had in the past. It reflects the reality that government is a joint endeavour between elected ministers and civil servants, and that ministers must have confidence that they can work closely with their civil servants in a relationship of trust and understanding. I'm very glad to say that the government welcomed the guidance when it was published and said it would see how it worked out before considering any next step. So why did we finally stop short of conceding to ministers the final choice of candidate? After all, uh, it can be argued that it's quite a modest step, it would only affect a small number of appointments, though they are the most important ones. The Institute for Government itself has suggested in a recent document that actually conceding this might bolster trust. Well, just three points. First, if we really want appointments to be made on merit, what is the evidence that replacing the decisions of an independent panel with the decisions of a single individual will improve the chances of getting the best person for the job? In our view, it will make the final decision more subjective and more open to personal prejudice and favoritism. These risks are inherent in any selection process. They're never completely objective and independent. And that's particularly so where there's an individual whose power or authority exceeds all the others. But that is precisely why we should not formalize um, that power in the system or remove the checks and balances which have long been part of it. Secondly, and this is the nub of the issue, we fear that this would be the first step down the road to personal patronage and politicization. It would inevitably identify the permanent secretary with the current secretary of state. state. No doubt in part that's what it's intended to do. It would make it just a little less likely that the secretary of state would receive the objective impartial advice which is needed in the job. The next Secretary of State, and indeed the next government, would know that the incumbent was the personal choice of their predecessor, making it much more likely that the new Secretary of State would want to replace that permanent secretary with his or her personal choice. I'm not arguing that this will happen overnight, but fundamental change can come just as easily through a series of steps, small steps, in the wrong direction. We're clear that this would be the first of them and others would follow. 
thirdly, I just want to challenge the view that this is a small issue. The proposition that ministers should make the final choice is co co crosses a big line of principle. The modern civil service was founded on the principle that decisions on who to recruit should not be in the hands of one person because that was inconsistent with recruitment on merit and led to appointments based on patronage and favouritism. The Commission has never, except perhaps in wartime, to my knowledge, departed from that. We could, of, of course, take the risk, as the Institute for Government seems to be suggesting. But you see, the Civil Service Commission was not um, established to take a risk with a constitutional principle. It's as plain as can be from the way the 2010 Act is constructed and the debates in Parliament on the Act that we were put here to uphold the principle of an impartial civil service appointed on merit and to act as an explicit check on the power of the executive to make civil service appointments. I don't believe, therefore, it's in our gift to sign that principle away with the stroke of a pen, even if we wanted to do so. The right place to do that, if it is to be <coughs> done at all, is in Parliament and through legislation. I hope it doesn't come to that, because I come back to my opening point. Whether we're debating the first step down a road to ministerial choice, or the wider politicisation of senior appointments, someone has to explain why it would lead to a better civil service. Would it really have made, made it easier to introduce 2,500 academies, or to make progress on welfare and pension reform, or to keep the Olympics safe, or to avoid the problems like those which arose, arose over the West Coast main line. Governments are highly complex and technical business. It undoubtedly needs a high degree of competence and skill, both from politicians and civil servants. It's not clear, it's not clear to me, why ministerial choice or indeed wider politicization furthers that cause. So, my proposition today is that we respect the long-standing principle that an impartial civil service is not chosen by ministers. We give a chance to the new commission guidance which we have published, which puts that principle in a modern context and ensures that ministers have a substantial and proper role. And then we concentrate on the issue of skills, experience and capabilities, which really will transform the civil service. Thank you. David, thank you for giving <coughs> us that excellent platform for our later discussion. Uh, now over to Caroline for a ministerial perspective on yeah. these matters. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm delighted to have been invited by the Institute for Government uh, to be able to bring the perspective of uh, um, a former minister who underwent the process. Um, and whilst I completely accept that some things have changed since the time I went through it um, to, for the better, actually. I think there's some, uh, there's still further to go, and I will come on to that. But I would like to say straight away um, that I had a good experience of working with the civil service at DEFRA. Um, we found good alignment between ministers and civil servants. I was impressed by the impartiality. You must understand that when you spent 13 years in opposition, it's quite hard for the incoming ministers to believe that instantly civil servants can change their allegiance and serve the new lot. But that was absolutely my experience, and to the credit of the civil service and its long tradition of impartiality. Um, but I think it's also um, this relationship between the permanent secretary and the secretary of state really is absolutely crucial. Just consider that um, when I became a cabinet minister, I had absolutely no experience of being a government minister at any junior rank whatsoever. Straight to the top job um, in a department that I had not shadowed before going into government other than very briefly in 2003. So very different issues, people, acronyms. And then we had to take out 30% of the running costs of the department within five weeks. You couldn't make it up, really, could you? And I can assure you, you can't do that without the knowledge of the Permanent Secretary. And I was indebted to Helen Ghosh, who was the Permanent Secretary at the time when I arrived. 
who went in to bat for me round Whitehall, because that's what your permanent secretary has to be able to do. Uh, it's not just the secretaries of state that cut the deals across Whitehall, but the permanent secretaries also cut deals at the level of uh, their fellow civil servants. So it's a crucial relationship. And the other thing just to consider is that, you know, very soon you will find yourself under fire, for sure. Every minister does, and you're sitting there at select committee within a matter of weeks next to your permanent secretary, taking the bullets head on together. So, you know, it's really, really important that the chemistry between the two is really good and really strong. But Helen made it quite clear that she wanted to move on from DEFRA when I arrived. She'd worked at the department for five and a half years and was regarded as having done a good job. I didn't want to lose her for all the reasons I've just uh, outlined, but asked her you know, to stay for a few months just whilst we got our feet under the table. Um, and uh, at the time, quite a lot of permanent secretaries were moving. I, David may know the exact number, but I could think of six or seven who left in, in that early few months of churn. So obviously if you wanted to move on, you had to, had to seize the moment. So Helen left in October 2010 to fill the vacuum when David left the Home Office. And we then had an interregnum of six months before that place was filled permanently. Um, at the same time, we had an interregnum of Director of Communications and Head of News. And I'm sure you will all recall that DEFRA had its issues during that time not least the, the, the situation with forests. So very difficult, I think, for, a, for, for small departments that lose their key civil servants rapidly and then to go through a long period of uh, waiting whilst uh, the, the vacancy is filled. We had a very good acting um, permanent secretary, but even for anybody in an acting key position, there isn't the, you know, there isn't the quite the confidence of, you know, knowing that you're going to take all those decisions forward. And I think it leaves the department quite vulnerable for a long period of time. So I didn't know what was involved. I had a visit from the cabinet secretary who explained to me that I wouldn't be able to choose. I challenged this somewhat because I'd already appreciated how important this relationship is and because I've come from the business world and it just seemed very strange to me that, you know, the chief executive couldn't have a say finally in who the chairman of the company should be. Um, and I, I did challenge it. I understand the business about permanency and impermanency. Of course it's true that politicians can be here today and gone tomorrow and that the permanent secretary will be more permanent. But for the time you're together, it's an absolutely crucial working relationship. So I have a counter proposition. This is beginning to sound like an Oxford Union debate, isn't it? You'll vote at the end. Um, <laughs> actually, I don't think it's either the minister decides who hold, ho holds that job or the Civil Service Commission decides who holds that job. I think there should be the power of co-decision. I really can't see why the Secretary of State can't be on this panel that actually reaches this final decision. And for the following reasons. The motivations, I think, of the wider Civil Service and of the Secretary of State of the Department <coughs> could be quite different. Um, I learned very quickly at DEFRA, my new department, that it's incredibly important that the person in the top job really cares about the environment. That might seem obvious to you, but you'll be surprised how many people came before me as for public appointments that didn't seem to really, really understand how important that is for a department where you're going to lead. Lead people who've chosen to go and work in that department because they really want to save the planet. There's quite a strong altruistic streak in DEFRA, and that's an important feature. You know, they're very bright people. I think of those fast-track civil servants, you know, that we actually could choose to come and work for us in the private office. Incredibly bright people who could get probably two or three times the salary by working in the private sector. Uh, but they've chosen to come and serve their country and do something with a passion that they care about to protect the environment. So, of course, all of this was fed in. I was consulted about what attributes I thought were important for a Secretary of State at DEFRA. But I also knew that the Civil Service has wider uh, issues that it wants considered in the new candidate. Obviously, diversity was one of those. Uh, the government was very keen to have more women, more candidates from uh, black and ethnic backgrounds. I understand all of that, but those are different, perhaps, from the perspective of the Secretary of State. So why not bring all those perspectives together at the moment that the panel comes 
to its view, be present at the discussion of those relative merits. Now, things have improved in terms of the interview, but at my time, I was not allowed to ask the candidates questions. We had a hybrid situation where they could ask me questions, but I could not ask them questions. I'm very pleased, David, that that has changed. We do live in the 21st <laughs> century. There surely could be nothing wrong uh, with two-way traffic. Of course, you could ascertain from the questions that the candidates asked you something about their abilities. I mean, I should make very clear that the Permanent Secretary at, at DEF was clearly a uh, very strong candidate in that hybrid process. Um, and I'm glad, very much, I'm glad that that has improved. But that, that final decision, the idea that you can't <coughs> choose, is actually quite disempowering. And uh, I know that um, the Civil Service Commission, the Cabinet Secretary, were confident they would make the right choice for me, but not to be involved in reaching that choice, I think, is actually quite difficult. <coughs> I do believe that trust is very important to the good working uh, in a government department, and I think that it builds up over time with alignment. But obviously, you're going to be more bought into the choice if you've been part of making it, aren't you? So that is my proposition that should be the power of co-decision, and I hope that that will be uh, given some significant uh, thought. I just wanted to make some other sort of general points. Having run a relatively small department uh, in government, I think there's something the civil service needs to consider quite carefully because the big departments tend to plunder the smaller departments for their talented people. And you're allowed to go almost straight away, you know, to the bigger department because the security of the country is at risk. We must have this DEFRA DG straight away. And the small departments are often left for months and months trying to backfill those appointments. And I do think thought needs to be given to that because it makes the smaller departments more vulnerable. I think actually probably now is a good time to look at the way in which the career development of civil servants can be enhanced by systematically moving civil servants between departments. Because I saw as civil servants left DEFRA and others came to us from other departments that we imported good ideas and new practices from different departments. We cross-fertilised best practice and that I think is good. I'm going to say that I think there should be more opportunities for civil servants on their way up the ladder, perhaps to the top job of permanent secretary, to have worked outside in the private sector. Uh, because I think that you shouldn't have be penalised for going to work outside the civil service um, to acquire contemporary skills that you can then bring back into the civil service from which it benefits. I know it's very hard at the moment because we can't pay civil servants a great deal more, there aren't a lot of vacancies, there aren't a lot of promotions, but maybe thinking in terms of seconding out and then being able to come back and promoted because of the additional skills acquired. I think that will bring in quite a lot more delivery capacity uh, and I think that's what ministers are looking for. They're looking for civil servants who can implement the agenda that's been jointly agreed and so a lot of delivery being done in the private sector, the more you can learn about delivery and bring it into the public sector. I think that's, that's likely um, to be beneficial. And once again, that may highlight a difference between the way the civil service looks at the skill set for a permanent secretary and the way the minister looks at the skill set. The minister looking for somebody with a delivery track record and in, in the permanent secretary at DEFRA there is uh, a, a permanent secretary who delivered big projects at the Department for Transport. That's very much a positive. But perhaps with a more of an interest on policy making, which may be something that more widely across the civil service is looked for in a permanent secretary, then that emphasis on delivery could be downplayed. But if you all sat round the table, Secretary of State, civil service commissioners, and actually thrashed out together what you genuinely thought was in the department's wider interest, as well as government's wider interest, I can't see why that wouldn't be a better decision. So I think, you know, this is the right time to change and improve. I've got the highest regard for civil servants. Civil servants are bright people who choose to serve their country, as I say, often could have been better remunerated, but make that choice. But I think this is too, this part of the reform could be an opportunity actually to improve career development as well, engender greater trust between ministers and managers, and that way I think we'll have better alignment and I would argue that will make the 
the country better governed. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for that very clear and, depending on your viewpoint, slightly alternative or major alternative proposition, which we can come on to. Uh, over to Ian Davis to speak from a slightly different perspective. Ian. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I've been asked to give a few perspectives from the uh, private sector, and uh, most of my life was spent in the uh, private sector, and so I will talk a little bit about that uh, to begin with, but I should just say, as Ian said at the beginning, I have uh, worked for an NED in a cabinet office the last two years, and I have had the privilege of being on a couple of uh, appointment panels. So I have a little bit of experience of how things work in the civil service, but primarily my experience is through the uh, private sector lens. So in line with my brief, what I'll, I'll, I'll do, and I hope I don't sort of bore too many people, just I'll summarize how <coughs> typically this sort of appointment process works in the private sector and try and draw out some of the analogies which I think are relevant to the public sector and some which I think are not, because the private sector and the public sector are different. They have different objectives with different ethos as well. But I think there are some lessons that can go from the private to the public. And by the way, I think a bit from the public to the private uh, too, we can get on to that. And then I'll just give a few personal thoughts, and they will be personal on the issue that Caroline and uh, David have talked about. Very, very quickly, just how would this sort of process, the appointment of the CEO, and I think if I can compare the private sector with CEO and the minister as chairman, it's not quite right, but just for the purpose of this argument, how would the CEO appointment process work in a typical Western public company, public, not family owned or privately owned? Uh, first of all, there would be a nomination committee uh, drawn from the board. The board would be elected by the shareholders. A nomination committee of the board uh, would uh, consider candidates uh, for the CEO. The chairman might either chair the nomination committee or would be on it. It can be both models can work. The chairman would be there, so it would be there in the nomination committee. There'll be a trawl of internal and external candidates, uh, typically, and then the nomination committee would get a short list of candidates and then decide to recommend to the board, to the board, not to the chairman, what the uh, preferred candidate or if there was. No agreement, the two preferred, or occasionally I've only once seen it, three preferred candidates. But the point I want to make is a no nomination committee drawn from the board at which the chairman of the board would be present in some form. Uh, a, a, a period of review and debate, often using external search uh, uh, consultants of external hires involved, look at internal candidates, go through a quite a thorough process of evaluation, a short list, and then from the short list, a recommendation of one or two to the board. The point I want to say is that the board makes the final uh, decision. Uh, I would just draw out two points, because you can describe processes, but the really important thing about process is what actually happens. Who does what? You know, who, you know, you've got to get beyond the he says, she says, always in these uh, uh, processes. Uh, I would just make two points that think I think are relevant. The chairman does not decide the appointment, but it's inconceivable to me. I've never seen it where a CEO is appointed and the chairman was violently opposed. So the, the chairman in most private company situations would always have a bigger I influence on it in terms of who not, but they wouldn't actually say it must be X. That would be unusual. Occasionally you get a very strong chairman who dominates a board, and if you have a board that's dominated by the chairman's cronies, which sometimes happens, it might be the same thing. And all these sort of human things go on. It's very important, actually, the human dimension of all these uh, processes, because, you know, who's around? and what sort of person they are is hugely important, which I think, David, you may want to talk, and Caroline, again, it, that we need to talk about personalities sometimes as well. But the point is, there's a lot, the chairman is very influential in this, I think rightly so, but there are quite a lot of checks and balances in typical private sector governance, and that is enshrined in the governance codes, by the way, certainly in the UK, Germany, and the US, and increasingly in Asia and Western as well. So that, that is the, 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 fir the key point I would uh, make. Second point I would then come on to, there are big differences between the private sector and the public sector, the objective function, the alignment, the need for consensus, constituencies, blah, 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 you know that as well as I do. I think it is a much more uh, 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 subtle point. And then you've also got the, uh, as David described so well, you've got some principles and ethos about the civil service being independent and impartial and objective, you know, politicians have their own objectives as well. So there are clear differences. I would just make, I can make a couple of points and then just conclude with a couple of personal perspectives on the issue. Uh, firstly, this idea of appointing on merit, um, I, I think cannot be argued with, but the key question is what do we mean by merit? Um, uh, this argument being objective and impartial, um, it's good. I, I sort of 
half made my living as a consultant by being objective and partial, but I'd say two points about that. I know from bitter experience that you can be objective and impartial and wrong <laughs> and give bad advice. You can be objective and impartial and have a complete personality meltdown with the chief executive that you're advising. So uh, when I think we need to take the debate a bit beyond merit and objective and impartial and get into effective whilst being objective and impartial. It's inconceivable that civil servants would not be objective and impartial. I met them, I see them, it just oozes through the ethos. It's one of the great assets, I think, of the British uh, civil service. But I have to say, it doesn't always mean to say they're effective. And if a, if a minister or another person has an allergic reaction to you, or can't, and it happens, we all know this when it comes to it, I think it matters because in the end, the advice has to be useful. It has to lead to a better outcome, a better civil service, whatever you want to. So I, I, would, I would encourage a, 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 to get beyond the taglines and get into what are we really trying to do here in effectiveness whilst preserving and protecting a valuable ethos. I think we all think that uh, objectivity and political impartiality and civil service an important ethos, but can we bridge the gap? And I, I, I worry that this debate is polarizing between two principled ideals that are not necessarily in conflict with each other. For me, the problem to be solved is how can we improve the effectiveness, the relationship between the minister's substance whilst preserving the reasonable, the reasonable and legitimate requirement of the long term that civil service is impartial. And I think it's better to phrase that question rather than polarize it, are we impartial? I, I, is it about accountability? The second point I think is, I do think we have to address this issue of accountability, which I find very, very difficult uh, myself in the civil service and political environment. And how can you be accountable for something when you don't control or influence the levers by which that accountability is delivered? I think this is true for politicians, uh, and I think it's particularly true now, and I think it's a big contextual change compared to what I understand 20 years ago. There's much more emphasis on what people now call delivery. And we used to call it results or impact or getting stuff done. But delivery is the buzzword in the civil service world. The more you focus on delivery, and I think most of you, the more accountability comes sharper. And if you are accountable for something as a minister or as a civil servant, but you don't have the power of appointment, you don't have the resources, how can you be said to be accountable? And I think this is a big issue in governments generally. I think the private sector, it's easier, a lot easier in the private sector. But the notion of being accountable without having authority or resources would be considered a non-start in the private sector. And if you said you're accountable for building a big business in Asia, the first thing you do as a manager, how much money have I got, who can I get? And you said, no, 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 you've got no money, and we'll tell you you've got, you'd say, forget it, I'm not gonna do it. So you I think this issue of accountability authority is a huge issue, very, very difficult to solve, but you have to somehow link that. And I think this is partly why I think, potentially ministers are being told, I'm sure somebody said, just go out, you know, you know, improve the school system or that. And then you've got this issue, okay, but resources, people, and all the rest that need to be thought through. And you've got a countervailing balance from people who've been in the profession who may also be saying, ah, we've seen this one before. We've seen this one before. And so I think this issue of accountability and authority is at the heart of this. It's a very difficult problem, this, and I don't think it's going to be solved anytime soon. And it's absolutely being wrestled with everywhere. Every public sector I know is wrestling with this problem. And the notion that there's a quick fix or a quick headline that will do it is quite wrong. Where it has been solved, like Singapore, it may or may not be acceptable in many countries in the world. They have made it quite clear, we know who's in charge. I mean, civil, you know, you know it's run like a corporation with all the upsides in terms of delivery, but all downsides in terms of um, some of the controls or ethoses or dem democratic ways people like. So there are different models here, but I just want to say it's a very, very difficult problem and to come to decisions on issues like this without recognizing that accountability authority point is there. So those are just some general perspectives saying this is a tricky. I don't think this should be an issue of principle. I think the problem to be solved is how can we get the right chemistry and focus on delivery between the perm sec and, 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 and the minister whilst preserving rather is this an issue of objectivity, impartiality versus, you know, I'm in charge here. I think that just just presen it presents the problem in an unsolvable way. And I slightly regret the way the debate's gone in the last uh, couple of weeks. I think both Caroline and David said in, in different ways. Let me just finish with a, uh, a couple of points that might help uh, uh, push this forward. Um, firstly, I do think that what do we mean by decision? Uh, in effect, I do think that ministers, I think that ministers here effectively can decide through veto. And that may not be a bad way to go in the short term. That person is not, just wouldn't work for me. And that's what happens in the private sector. The chairman says, 
I hear you, nomination committee, I just can't work with that person. You go back again. Now, I know it's a weak form of appointment, but you know, just thinking about checks and balances on ministers and on the civil servants, I don't feel comfortable with ministers, and I'm not sure many ministers would be on the decision-making panel. I think the behavioral consequences in dynamics would be quite tricky. I'd prefer the ministers to have a decision-making part outside that panel. I frankly just agree with you on that. That's my instinct, so I think thinking through the process. But I do think the effect of decision-making power, how the minister can get involved in what I think is a legitimate interest, because as I said, you know, chemistry, shared belief is a very important part of effective advice. It's not just objectivity and partiality. The second point I would make, and I'll conclude on this, and I would say this, wouldn't I, as an MED, I do think this is an area where possibly the non-executive directors or the lead MEDs, it, which are increasingly involved in the department, could play a good role in helping with this process, ensuring that the civil service is protected in the long-term interest of the country, and that the minister's interested are protected in the interest of the minister trying to fulfill his government. And I think how NEDs or the lead NED are used in this process I think is important. I would say the same also for de-appointments or firing people. And there must be occasions when this debate is the, flip, the negative side of an appointment is when a, a, a permanent secretary and a minister may fall out with each other. I think, again, we need to have a parallel process for that, I think. I think possibly the lead NEDs or the NEDs could play a valuable role in protecting uh, the ethos and the values that David espoused, I think which menace aspire to, but also promoting the legitimate interests of uh, uh, political ministers. So I would just conclude with those uh, context of points. Thank you. Ian, thank you so much. Uh, some interesting ideas there too. Now it's your turn. Uh, just two quick points. First of all, we will ensure that you get away by two o'clock. We should close this at two o'clock. Secondly, could you please say who you are as you ask your question or make your contribution. Yes. Uh, thank you. Alan Bailey, uh, former permanent secretary of the Department of Transport, a long time ago. Uh, I thought all three speakers made very interesting points, uh, but I don't think any of them quite gave an answer to the prior basic question, what's a permanent secretary for? And uh, uh, you may say that's uh, impossible to answer, but I wouldn't suggest even how, how much has changed in, in that long gap. Uh, the, the essential is the same to, for a permanent secretary's job is to mediate between the Secretary of State and the department so that the Secretary of State can get the best out of the department, both in policy advice and in delivery, which I would say are equally important. Put them in any order you like. Uh, and if that's right, um, then the relationship on both sides is equally important. And ministers have always had uh, a considerable say in the appointment, uh, as David's been saying, of, uh, of the permanent secretary. And if that relationship between the permanent secretary and the secretary of state goes wrong, this is a serious problem. Uh, but my worry on the other side is if the, uh, the, the, the say of the secretary of state is formalized and made, quotes, final, then the department is going to see the the uh, permanent secretary as, as the minister's um, sidekick is going to, um, um, to, to see him as a sort of uh, super special advisor. And that makes the job much harder. Caroline Swan talked about uh, the um, wanting the department and, and including the permanent secretary to to care about the things that the Secretary of State cares about, and then it will work. The difficulty comes where the department has rather different cares than the Secretary of State. I think of the Home Office and the not-fit-for-purpose episodes that they've had, and it seems to me that if the permanent secretary simply spoke, treated as the Minister of the Secretary of State's spokesman, spokesperson, uh, uh, they will not be able to do the job which is essential. The other point which David made briefly is if a um, Secretary of State has the, uh, the final say, and therefore the Permanent Secretary is the personal appointment, then when the Minister changes, let alone when the Government changes, the new Minister is going to think that they have a right to do the job again, and, and that will <coughs> the job will cease to be, quote, permanent. Okay, let's, let's collect a couple of other thoughts before we ask the panel to respond. Jill. 
Yes, please. Okay, if you would. Uh, hi, I'm Jill Rutter. I'm in the government now, but I'm a former civil servant at DEFRA, which I was recruited, re recruited to from, I think I can as a private sector recruit, despite the fact that I'd actually spent the bulk of my career before that. Um, I think we're slightly misrepresenting the current process. Um, we know that there are quite a number of permanent secretary and indeed perhaps the cabinet secretary appointments where actually you could say the process is largely dominated by ministerial choice at the moment. Where someone is an existing civil servant, people seem to emerge to get the posts through uh, a rather opaque system. Uh, I didn't notice a particularly open competition around appointing Jeremy as cabinet secretary. I think it's a great appointment, but if uh, whatever. And uh, in other cases where somebody has moved on level transfer, the process doesn't necessarily seem to accord to that. And the dominant thing seems to be certainly from within the civil service, it looked like uh, the previous cabinet secretary was simply giving people the permanent secretary they wanted. Similarly, we have the situation where in private office and for other posts, if it's an internal competition, the minister gets a choice. You then have this problem that if it's an external competition, you get into this situation, I had this when I was appointing fairly trivial appointments head of news at DEFRA, where we Secretary of State legitimately, I thought, wanted a choice, but I was barred by the rules from giving him a choice with an external competition. So we had to sort of fake a way of giving him a choice where we organised the candidate to go and see. So I think we're slightly misrepresenting the position now. And I think in response to Alan, for whom I used to work, we're also misrepresenting the other side of it, which is if the Secretary of State clearly doesn't get on with the Permanent Secretary, that's incredibly disempowering in the department. I mean, you can pick that up at the department where you know that the Permanent Secretary has no credibility with your Secretary of State. So I think actually knowing that the Permanent Secretary and the Secretary of State are aligned can actually be very empowering for the Permanent Secretary, can raise the status of the civil service in the department. So I think it's not all one-way traffic. Thank you. Yes, one more contribution, then we'll bring the panel back in, back of the room first, then Robert. Thank you. Brunella Longo, I'm an information management consultant. I ask these two <coughs> quick questions from the perspective uh, that I'm mostly interested in, uh, and, and that is uh, how can we best, how can we design information workflows in, in the most suitable way in, that in different contexts? So first, first of all, is there any... Uh, drawback or negative aspect from uh, cross-fertilizing uh, diverse uh, departments with uh, uh, temporary assignments of people coming from um, here or there, picking up diverse expertises. And secondly, is there any particular warning we may be aware of when we design information <coughs> workflows uh, or policies or governance advice, uh, uh, becoming fascinated with the um, possibility that the good advice uh, is connected with chemistry and uh, what is the... Um, drawing line between chemistry and heteros. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Let, let us have a response to the panel. Caroline's itching to get uh -huh. in on one point. Uh, well, just to summarise, we've had what's the permanent secretary for, importance of relationships, what happens on ministerial change, are permanent secretary super spads? Well, that would put a different uh, construction on the thick of it, wouldn't it? Mm. Uh, and a very opaque system at the moment, discuss. Mm. Well, I think if you reach in mediation point, then something's gone catastrophically wrong. And actually, <laughs> serious thought needs to be uh, applied to how you mediate a situation where a relationship is broken down between the permanent secretary and, uh, and uh, the secretary of state. Um, I think this point about felt accountability is really important. It is quite frankly weird to go into run an organisation where you have no line management responsibility very strange. Certainly if anything goes wrong, then the politician is going to have to carry the can for that, even if the management was dreadful. Um, so it is a very strange situation where you don't have my line management responsibility. I think in practical terms, we got round it at DEFRA because all the ministers were really concerned for the people who worked for the department. So 
So implementing the kind of cuts that we had to bring through, you know, 29% in our running costs in order to secure a good capital settlement in the Treasury, we said to the Permanent Secretary, you know, is there, what can we do to help you um, bring through such a difficult decision? Are there particular parts of department we should go and talk to, we could raise morale? And we went out of our way to praise the civil servants who'd done a very good job in developing policy, finding other ways. It shouldn't have got to the point of, of, of needing mediation. Um, I think the civil servant appointment system is pretty opaque. It was pretty opaque to me as Secretary of State. I hardly knew people were suddenly going to go and they'd suddenly say, I'm off next week. And I didn't know it was going to happen. And actually, I have no idea what the Civil Service Commission does. And I think transparency is now a requisite in the private sector. And more transparency in the appointment process, I think, would give people a sense of more fairness, more empowerment, <coughs> more awareness of what's happening in different departments. So um, I might feel more comfortable about not being in on the panel process if I had any idea what the panel process looked like. And as to the... Um, as to the question about cross-fertilization, good ideas, I'll give you a glorious anecdote. I've already said it's hard for small departments to make their way around Whitehall, getting the things they need. The big departments <coughs> sometimes sit on decisions that the small departments desperately need in order to meet their deadlines and their business plans. Of course, at the time of a reshuffle, ministers move around. And as one deputy minister politely put it, he met himself coming back on the way to the Home Office and was able to unblock something that he'd been wanting to unblock for some period of time. So the straight answer is, the more cross-fertilization I think we can get as part of the um, career development of civil servants, you know, the less likelihood there is of, this, uh, of, of these blockages occurring. There's always going to be an inherent bit of gradient between the smaller departments and the bigger departments. But moving people around, I think, would ha help be helpful. Thank you. Uh, David, Ian, transparency? Um, I, I'm all in favour of transparency, um, and uh, I do everything possible to ensure that it happens. If I can just address Jill's point um, directly, um, there are occasions, they are less than they used to be, but there are occasions when the management of the civil service, not me, the management of the civil service decides to move people around. Um, and when that happens, it's called a managed move. When that happens, um, it's very difficult sometimes to understand how that has happened and how the person mentioning their name has popped out of the system. And I don't defend that. Don't defend it. Uh, because I think it is opaque and I don't think it is good for the person put in that job apart from anything else. Sometimes it's necessary, but I think it's better if there is some process which opens it up a bit. Uh, but I have no part in that. Secondly, the reason the law is very specific about bringing people in from outside is because you're in a whole different ball game when you are recruiting people at any level from outside the system. Um, because um, uh, the law rightly there requires that there's a real proper test of the suitability of those people to do the job and also says they can't just be chosen because somebody thinks it's uh, a good idea. And my main role is in relation to open competition. The civil service has decided that I and my commissioners should also have a role where there is an internal competition, a proper competition at senior uh, levels where we apply the same rules. Um, even if it's a civil service-wide competition at the senior levels as we would in um, external competitions. And we don't, therefore, participate. We won't participate in a competition where um, our rules are not applied. And let's just be clear about this. The law says government departments has to have to um, obey the principles of the Civil Service Commission. If they don't, they're acting unlawfully. They're acting unlawfully. Can I just say one other thing slightly more? Um, uh, positively. I, I didn't disagree with Alan Bailey's description of what a permanent secretary does, although they, they vary um, very much these days from big, small departments. And actually, it's by the way, uh, just picking up something Caroline said, it's not always the case that it's the minister who is looking for delivery experience. In my experience, about half of them say, I want some delivery. About half say, actually, I want somebody who knows the policy and can watch my back. I think um, that ideally you want a bit of both and 
That's why I think what we're talking about, all of us, is trying to devise a system which enables all the influences, including ministers, to come round a table, I agree about that, actually make sure the job is properly described and make sure the process then does everything it can to get the person who matches that job. I would say that that is better done by the process that we've put on the table, but I would say that. But it is the same aim, which is to make sure that you get the best person for the job that needs doing and that ministers are properly involved in that. And of course, there's none of us who are going to try to run a system which forces onto a minister somebody they can't work with, which of course is why there's a veto at the end. Uh, since we know there's a veto, we'll do everything possible to try to make sure that ministers do not get faced with somebody they can't work with. It'd be absolutely dumb of us to do that. That has always been the case, and I guess it always will be. Thank you. Ian, in conversation earlier, you had some observations about transparency and its importance as you saw it. Would you like to elaborate? Yes, I mean, I think you've always got to be careful. Transparency is one of those words that you can always hide behind when you're stuck for something to say. But um, I, I do think the process is unnecessarily opaque in the sense that I've been quite... Actually, I've been quite impressed by the process. I've been involved in a couple of recruitment process and the quality and the um, rigour with which it's done. Um, has impressed me, and I didn't even know it was done. I think many people are not aware. Now, I'm sure you're right at the very top, maybe there are some that are not uh, totally transparent. But generally speaking, I have found, coming in, I'm an, I'm an outsider, insider, I, I think the, the process, I think, is pretty rigorous. I would just make two comments about it. Firstly, we talked about, and, and the point about the role of the firm is an interesting one, I, I, and, and I'd like to think about that more. But I, I, my feeling is the role, which permanent sector we're talking about, I think the roles are different from minister to minister and department to department. That may not be a satisfactory thing. One thing is there's a lot of emphasis in the pr uh, point on the right person. And compared to the private sector, not much emphasis on for what job. Is this the right person for the perm set? You know, in the private sector, you say, what over the next five years does this perm set need to do? And there'll be a lot more focus in the private sector on the job before you talk about the person. Whereas my impression of the civil service is a lot more focused on the person to do a role. And I think if you're, I'm guessing, if you're leading DEFRA or DEC or the MOD um, or a constitutional form, the type of skills, delivery, policy, needs a lot more parsing. This is where I think the minister's input at the beginning in an interview is absolutely crucial. What do they need to do? Because we all know that different people have different types of skills. And yet there's this talk about the best person to be a perm set. And there's usually a taxi rank, I sense, coming up of highly promising PEGs you know, there in line. And I would just say one way to get over is to be much more clearer about the roles, the task involved with the role of the perm set need to be uh, analysed and possibly made transparent so that you're judging it. The second point I would make, just on external bringing people in, the two panel and some others, I think, I would say that generally the calibre and number of external applications has been incredibly weak incredibly weak and if people suspect that the civil servants are ignored it, it is in my view not fair but i think that's quite a bias towards recruiting externally people would love to have more diversity but generally speaking i think there are bigger issues about pay role you know all that sort of stuff which we won't get into now um, but I if there's i know there are some concerns i'm not really serious about bringing people in outside that's absolutely not my experience it's just the general caliber of external applications relative to in internal that I've seen is, is, is very, very woeful. That perhaps raises an interesting point, which is um, David emphasizing right at the beginning that is there enough emphasis indeed on skills and skill sets required? Uh, now, one thing we haven't considered so far, and before I bring in our next question, it's probably most appropriate, is what the constitutional implications of any changes may be. Uh, David talked about the breach of a fundamental principle by potentially getting the Secretary of State involved in uh, any further way than she or he is right now, for example, on the interviewing panel. Uh, Caroline didn't quite see it that way and thought that was an essential step in the process. Uh, Robert Hazel from the Constitution Unit, you may well have wanted to address a different point, in which case please do so, but I'd be interested if you wanted to point pick that up. No, it's, it's, it's sort of related. Um, like Ian, I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute for Government. Um, I wanted to widen the debate a tiny bit so that we don't just have two contrasting models of the civil service and the private sector uh, and encourage people to discuss models from the wider public sector. Um, and I'm going to refer to a very narrow uh, bit of the public sector, namely senior G20 
judicial economy. Now, it may appear to have no relevance to the Republic of France Act, but bear with me. Um, and Tom Legg sitting just in front of me can tell me if I get anything wrong. Until 2012, uh, all judges, all senior judges, were appointed in effect by the Lord Chancellor, and he had uh, a lot of freedom of choice. He consulted the senior judges, but he decided, he made the appointment, uh, and then, following the Constitutional Reform Act, a commission was established, the Judicial Appointments Commission, very like the Civil Service Commission, and it followed the same important uh, process that uh, David Maxwell, which is a, well, it's giving implementation to a constitutional principle in that the Judicial Appointments Commission presented the Lord Chancellor and does present the Lord Chancellor with only a single name. <coughs> and Jack Straw and Ken Clark separately, uh, in different ways, clearly felt uncomfortable about that. Jack Straw, and this is a public knowledge, felt very uncomfortable when presented with a single name for a new president of the family division, a senior appointment in the Court of Appeal uh, early in 2010, but didn't feel able to reject it, although on paper he had a foreign veto, because it was in the run-up to the election and he feared that then getting married would be policy. Ken Clark uh, has since proposed that the Lord Chancellor should be a member of the selection panel, so the Caroline Spellman solution. Um, and that proposition, uh, I think, others can correct me if I'm not up to date, is in the Crime and Courts Bill currently going through Parliament. Um, so there are different models in relation to senior judicial appointments. I hesitate a bit because I know the government uh, was possibly having second thoughts, and if anyone knows the latest on the Crime and Courts Bill, please tell us. Just to finish, in terms of when the Lord Chancellor did have a very wide discretion, it's interesting to see how it was exercised in practice. Um, and in practice, although there was uh, political preferment in the first half of the 20th century, in the second half of the 20th century that died away, uh, and in effect the appointments were on merit, um, with no political preferment for the last 50 years or so, as a result of convention. And so the thought I would leave you with is that in trying to regulate behavior, convention may be as important as, as hard rules. And I'd like possibly to hear something from David about the convention that the commission has tried to promote, um, not simply the hard rules. No, we, we have uh, a few other inputs um, before getting that response. You, you wanted to come in and then we and somebody over here. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip Ward from the uh, Better Government Initiative. Um, it's a reflection on some of the things that have been said. And uh, I'm a little bit dubious about this importance, about this uh, chemistry issue between Secretary of State and Ministers. Um, and uh, clearly, you know, it goes without saying that if it's completely awful, it won't work at all. And nobody in their right mind is going to try and set up a relationship like that. But the reality is, if you look at the last reshuffle, I think all of the major departments... I think I'm right in this, lost a majority of their ministers. So you can go to enormous lengths to set up uh, chemistry between two people. That relationship may last very little time at all. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure that becomes, to me, the most important thing to do when you're trying to find the right person to do the job. If you're trying to focus in on the current chemistry between two people in what may be a very short-term relationship, that doesn't seem to be all that sensible. Uh, the other thing that... Uh, I, I'm a bit surprised nobody's talked about in the role of the permanent secretary. There's an important one about leadership and the ability to actually uh, galvanize the department, uh, to create the right culture within the department, uh, which means it is a, uh, an organization capable of delivering over a period of time uh, and not entirely focused on short-term objectives. So I just thought there were a couple of things there that I wasn't uh, picking up. Generally, I, 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 mean I, I thought uh, David's exposition of where the commission have got to and the approach they're taking uh, was uh, pretty convincing. It seems to me that you know that, that the moment they're drawing the line at the right place, and I don't think I would personally want to encourage him to go any further than he's gone already. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Kevin White from the Home Office. Um, 
one of the difficulties, it seems to me, though, is there's a deep ambiguity here, which is about whether, to put it really crudely, civil servants work for the country or for the government. And I'm kind of characterising it, if you like. There's a, there's a sense, I think, in the civil service from the past that we have an obligation to the Crown and we have some obligation which is longer standing than to the immediate administration. The administration, of both, of whatever colour, uh, takes the view that we're here to do something and this is an executive role and we need people that will do what we want here and now. Uh, and I think there are kind of tectonic plates that are shifting there and I think there is some ambiguity around that. And I think it's because of that ambiguity that things that may seem very small practical things uh, become perceived as quite substantial issues of principle. Uh, and I, I think there's a risk of us generally reacting as if things were too big issues of principle when they are <coughs> actually things to do with practically making things work better. But that underlying ambiguity, I think, makes this a really difficult thing to judge. If you may just take one, one further contribution from over here before you respond. Uh, I'm Robert Morland. I may be on dangerous ground because I've been a politician. Um, I was a former member of the European Conservative member of the European Parliament, a councillor. Uh, and before I came here, the one thing I looked up was my edition of the Richard Crossman Diaries, which some may recall at its time stirred up an awful lot because of the reporting of his dispute with his formidable permanent secretary who after two months sat him down to lunch and said you want to sack me don't you um, to which he he replied by saying no I want you to serve me and not serve others and I actually must say in a way I'm slightly appalled by the discussion because to me I would have thought and I disagree with the gentleman over there that first of all uh, a minister does have to have a cabinet minister does have to have some rapport with the permanent secretary and must look at that. And secondly, what they, the two other features that they bring in, which is for us that they can make a judgment on who's going to be best carrying out the proposals of government, not in a political sense. And it leads me on to my third point by saying that I think uh, that it's not actually that ministers sit there thinking politically about the person in a party way. <laughs> but remember, ministers are people who have been out there. They've been up council blocks. Um, they have a much better s sense in that sense of the outside world, and I don't think it should be underestimated. Okay, uh, rapport, interesting. We're, we're almost treating it, though it seems to me, as if it's binary. You either have it or you don't have it. There should surely be some room for discussion. Indeed, one can think of many examples where people haven't necessarily started with the best relationships and have forged a very strong one. And no doubt the department's been better for that, probably. Uh, however, we've got uh, convention, importance that pays, leadership, uh, and ambiguity around all of this, uh, as well as the points that the speaker just made. Caroline. Well, I just come back on this point about, uh, I think you're talking about. You've, you have to be political with a small p. I'm not talking about party political. It's actually a very important attribute in a civil servant is to understand politics with a small p. And my experience was some of my civil servants were quite political uh, and sometimes spotted trouble before I did. Um, <coughs> and other civil servants were not that political. And it's a mix. But I think you won't be able to take the, the, the political small p out of it altogether. Back to this chemistry point. Um, uh, it, the reason why I think the Secretary of State needs to be there at the time a decision is being made is because I have the sense, I haven't seen, that everybody else around the panel has the wider issues of the, of, of the civil service at, at top of its agenda. And I would say the Secretary of State would be there to really cross-check that the department's needs are being met. That, that was my case for having... But maybe, I'm wrong, maybe this panel of people who decide who I should have have somebody who really understands what the department's like to run. If they did, I'd feel more reassured. But I never met them, and I didn't know who was on the panel. So that's, that's the point. It's the point about, will this person really work 
for this department. And that's, that's what's sort of uppermost in my mind. I want to do a quick straw poll, because of the nature of the questions that come forward, I get the sense there's rather a lot of civil servants and former civil servants in the room. If you are a civil servant or a former civil servant, could you just show me, would you mind just showing me by a show of hands, roughly, roughly? So it's about half the room. And let me ask another question then, minus the journalists, who don't, I don't want them to put hands up. How many of you are from the private sector and have come to this seminar? One, two, three, okay. So about maximum of 10%. What I haven't heard much discussed in these questions is how difficult it is for people from the private sector to get a look in on these appointments. Now, that I realise that may not be very popular with 50% of the room, but let's just stop and consider it for a minute. The process, as defined in the most recent press release, says that it's got to be a fair and open competition. One of the things I discovered with quite a lot of the appointments from my department is they're not publicly advertised. They were being advertised on the internal civil service website. And that, I would suggest, is is one of the constraints in what is a biased market out there, are very able people who've run things and delivered things, who've lost their jobs, and could potentially have quite a lot to bring to all levels of the civil service. Now, I think that's changed again, and I think after I remonstrated, we did start to put advertisements on the Sunday Times appointments page and similar. But I just wonder how open, this is a question today, really, how open, <coughs> really, I, there was one candidate from the private sector out of the four on the short list that I was allowed to let them ask me questions. Um, and she didn't turn up because the salary was the issue. Because, they because the post can't exceed the salary that's paid to the Prime Minister. That's a big, that's a big deterrent, isn't it, to candidates from the private sector? Before David responds on that, the, the next Cabinet Secretary wants to say his piece on this subject. was extensively used. But for these senior jobs, search uh, firms, headhunters were also extensively used. And so I don't think there's a problem about finding people from the private sector. There's a problem about finding quality. Who is the most recent appointment that's been made? It's Stephen Lovegrove. Where did he come from? He comes from the private sector. I don't know what the, you know, where this this view you've got, it's a very sort of partial view of what is actually done. Well, quick, and quick, can I ask you one other question? Yeah, well, can I just quickly yeah. on that, just say that in my experience, especially where the public appointments were concerned, I was often only given the choice of one. All the candidates had fallen away. They might have come from the private sector, but you know, as, pe as people say, you're the client, the government is the client of the headhunters. If you want six people on the short list, you want half from the private sector, half from the public sector, or if you want half women, you can choose that, but I didn't get the sense that the short lists that ministers are presented with are actually that diverse. I, mean, I think what you're saying is that if they've fallen away, what it means is the panel has not found people who've got enough quality to put yes. in front of them. Exactly. Can I answer this question that's in the paper today, that you couldn't ask questions. I found this utterly incredible. It's changed. It's just not, it is just not true. It was, I'm all sorry, the time I was I there. <laughs> were putting, well, someone gave you bad advice mm -hmm. and you should never have accepted it. I mean, you can't just sit there and just be questioned. It's just, just ridiculous. Well, I can tell you that I this was the position. You know, I'm not making it, it up. It isn't the position. I, I can give you an example <laughs> <laughs> where ministers look at the candidates, they see that, and they give you very free in giving their opinions. And they didn't do it simply by saying, come into the room and tell me wh why you're good at this job. They had a proper two-way conversation. That's been going on for years. Well, this has changed now, but when I was there, there was a representative of the headhunter and there was a representative of the Civil Service Commission overseeing this one-way traffic of questions. <coughs> it was made very clear to me that that was the position. <coughs> it's now changed. I'm delighted to say it's gone back then to your experience. Uh, let's leave that there. I <laughs> rather feel that I'm back watching Murray and Jokovic again, but uh, <laughs> let, let us move on from that. David, there's a specific point that people have asked you to address, About but there is also problems. something around chemistry, its importance, and how, if at all, it can be catered for and also about convention. What conventions may or may not have been adopted by the Commission? Um, I had eight uh, Secretaries of State in my ten years as Permanent Secretary, so I uh, know quite a lot about getting the chemistry um, <laughs> right. Um, and um, I'm also clear that Permanent Secretaries of State, particularly later on in government, tend to move on 
uh, very fast and often don't stay for more than a year or 18 <coughs> months. Um, but um, I, I just want to address, first of all, this issue about what we're recruiting for, which you also raised, because it goes to the heart of this issue. We are recruiting for the job that needs to be done, but if we are recruiting for a permanent secretary, we are also, we have part of the role of a permanent secretary is the expectation that they will serve the next secretary of state and the one after that. And therefore, you're recruiting for a job with very specific skills and they, and, and I, we never have a sort of composite view these days of what a permanent secretary is. It has to be the permanent secretary at the Treasury or at the Home Office. They're rather different jobs, and, but nevertheless, there are some elements which are about the role and the long-term role. And actually trying to get that balance right. It's not the case that um, we sit around the table, and I don't let people sit around the table saying, let's just keep our eye on the long-term role. What I would like to see, in this is what we put on the table, is Secretary of State getting in there at the beginning, signing off who's off on the panel, which they're allowed to do, and actually saying, I don't think this panel's got the right composition. It's going to have too many insiders. I'm not keen uh, on there being too many insiders. Indeed, I try to intervene to stop there being a majority of civil servants on panels. So we are trying to open up this process and have um, proper uh, challenge in it. Is it perfect? No, because actually in the end, filling jobs is a, uh, an art and not completely a science or even half a science. On this issue of um, law against convention, um, by the way, I think it's true, but I stand to be corrected, that the government has withdrawn the proposition on uh, ju judges, um, on, on sitting on the panel and so on. I think the current, the new um, Secretary of State for Justice, Lord Chancellor, has withdrawn it. It ran into a lot of opposition in the House of Lords, and I think it's withdrawn, but who knows? Um, I'm not an expert on that. One of the interesting things about um, convention against sort of hard and fast rules is that we are now in a system in civil service appointments where there is primary legislation um, and from that derive some expectations about what rules are drawn up by the Civil Service Commission. Before that, the system was much looser and in a way it evolved through convention. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a debate in our constitution always about whether it's better not quite to describe uh, what happens because actually most of the time we can just rub along um, and actually there developed an understanding um, about what happens or whether it's better to have it in primary legislation. I just think that um, uh, the British constitution such as it is is bedeviled by convention uh, myself because uh, everybody can have a slightly different understanding of what the position is and that's fine as long as everybody is agreeing but it's not fine when people disagree. And so, um, but even, even if that wasn't the case, we now have in legislation, in the 2010 Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, the rules about civil service uh, appointments, and indeed legislation, primary legislation on the face of legislation that enshrines the principles of impartiality, objectivity, et cetera, honesty, integrity in, in the law. Civil servants must, by law, behave like that. Now, of course, that's... Is the single name just the, the example? The single... The single name. The single name meaning? The, the, the commission recommends only a single name. Uh, no. Um, what is enshrined in legislation is recruitment on merit through fair and open competition and a requirement that the Civil Service Commission defines um, what that means and there's no override on it. Now, we could, as I said, we, we have the power to define what it means. Um, Parliament was fairly clear they didn't expect this to go to... to there, was a, there was a lot of debate at the time of passing the Act, or some, about enshrining the current position, not changing it. And in fact, the op then opposition sought confirmation that there wouldn't be a change in the fundamental balance of power and that the Act wouldn't achieve that. that, that was, that's the point. Two, uh, just before inviting the final round, two, two observations from uh, a former Secretary of State whom we have interviewed in the course of, of this work. Uh, 
The first is that, uh, and perhaps David can pick up on the second one, but the first is that he certainly felt uh, a res responsibility not just to ensure as best he could that he got a permanent secretary with whom he could work, but also for future generations, including future generations of politicians from a different party. So, you know, again, we can be a bit binary about this and think that ministers' interests in the short term when uh, the evidence may suggest uh, otherwise. The second thing, and, and this, he said, was a confusion in his mind. As I mentioned at the beginning, David is, is the first person to embody the two roles of public appointments and <coughs> civil service commissioner. Uh, and the process is different in that ministers are offered a short list, as many of you in the room will know, for public appointments. And that arguably, certainly in this person's mind, did uh, <coughs> cause some confusion as to why the same process wasn't applied as far as the civil service was concerned. But perhaps we can pick that up uh, later. We've got one time for one final round here. Peter, and then yourself. Yeah, uh, Peter Riddle, director of the Institute for Government. Could I actually, just following up on those points, um, f first on, on the point of um, when things go wrong, they could also go wrong under the traditional system. Um, it's no guarantee. I mean, uh, your, your, your own uh, transfer to the, the Home Office occurred after a relationship had gone wrong um, between the previous Home Secretary and your predecessor. Um, that's no secret. Um, and so that can go wrong under those circumstances as well, as opposed to the, 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 the danger you're raising of a Secretary of State appointing someone being reshuffled a year later and then that coming in, which is clearly a problem. The point I wanted to raise was, well, I mean, following up from Robert Hazel's point, aren't the safeguards in the Act, in the, in the 2010 Act, which you rightly stress are very, very important, um, of impartiality and so on, aren't they really safeguarded by ensuring someone's above the line, the, the process the panel does initially? Don't those provide the safeguards? Aren't, aren't they sufficient safeguards to ensure against cronyism, favoritism, and so on? Okay, and just before you pick that up, David, uh, one further input here. Um, Ian Corby, I'm a researcher in the House of Commons. Just a couple of points to widen this out. Um, if you accept either greater ministerial involvement in the process or even go as far as co-decision, isn't it just a logical consequence that when there's a change of minister, particularly to the change of government, that that process ought to be repeated uh, and perhaps there should be you know, a full um, sort of reconfirmation. And secondly, we haven't discussed Parliament very much and um, Permanent Secretary is often the accounting officer responsible to Parliament and should there perhaps be some role for select committees in <coughs> confirming the appointments of Permanent Secretaries? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, well, David first and then Caroline on this. <laughs> I would say the answer to the last point is no. So would I. But then um, the executive would always think uh, that, wouldn't it? Um, it uh, perhaps I could just try and answer the, the two points about public appointments, and it sort of um, uh, relates a bit to what Peter said. Um, there are two systems, and there always have been. Um, for a long time, almost forever, um, there has been uh, a system for appointing civil servants which hasn't had um, ministerial choice. And there has been forever um, a system for public appointments <coughs> where ministers have been served up with a choice. And for the first time, I um, preside over both those systems. <coughs> the reason for the difference is that public appointments are generally to um, time-limited, largely non-executive, not wholly non-executive appointments to boards of public bodies to which the government has contracted out a great chunk of policy or implementation. And it has always been believed, and I share this view, that the elected government is entitled in that case as an act of policy and politics to make a choice of the people who are appointed um, to those bodies. And actually when they do, Peter, they bring personal and political issues to that choice. <coughs> that doesn't mean to say that the people appointed are unsuitable, because they are, they have to be suitable as judged and above the line. But in a sense it goes straight to the heart of the issue. <coughs> Ministers then make a political choice. And it is a political act, sometimes to change the nature of that body politically by appointing someone different. And that is precisely why that model doesn't work 
for a politically impartial civil service where people are um, there to serve the, uh, a permanent appointment and expected to survive that secretary of state and that government, though that is not always. Um, but of course, it leads to confusion. Um, since I preside over sis both systems, it doesn't seem confusing to me, but I accept that it is confusing um, to everyone else. Um, um, but I am very clear that in a sense, it, I, I don't believe that the serving up of a shortlist, as you describe it, actually is enough of a safeguard um, uh, uh, for um, permanent <coughs> civil servants. Um, that, that, uh, I, it, I believe it to be quite different, um, but um, uh, we, c we can argue uh, about that. That probably deals with both those uh, points. By the way, if I can just come back to, um, I th th it's very instructive um, when um, the Prime Minister went before the liaison <coughs> committee and was asked about this issue of appoint of ministers making a, a choice. Um, the very first thing he was asked about was, well, doesn't that mean you have to have confirmation hearings? Um, and I think um, uh, that's, that's, in a sense, the danger for uh, ministers, that there'll be increasing pressure uh, if they make the choice for that decision to be scrutinized by parliament in a confirmation hearing. And that is indeed what um, many select committees are looking for, I think. Karen. Yeah, well, just, just quickly on that select committee point, the reason I think it absolutely wouldn't work to have select committees confirming the appointment of permanent secretaries is remember how they had the Secretary of State and the Permanent Secretary in front of them on a regular basis, holding them to account and grilling them really hard on the decisions that they've made. I don't see when you, you know, you're partly bought in to those choices. You, I think it gets more difficult perhaps to give the people such a tough time. So I think you want that independence of Parliament. And this total reconfirmations, look, that's going to be pretty disruptive for the whole of government to have to hold open the question of who's running all these 22 departments every time there's a change of government. Remember what happened to me. Um, Helen Ghosh had served DEFRA for five and a half years, nearly all of that under Labour administration. Uh, my default setting was not in some way to doubt that she could she could serve a change of government and her expertise and her knowledge and her relationships which he built around Whitehall were critical to the, to the welfare of that department going forward. I didn't want her to go. So actually, um, that's <coughs> a very important part of the permanent secretary's job, you know, to know where the bodies are laid, to know um, where the attacks come from, uh, to know who your allies are, because especially for small departments, you have to have alliances around Whitehall to achieve the things you want to see. It's much easier for the bigger departments. And of course, Peter's absolutely right. I, you know, relationships can go wrong in the private sector, in the public sector. Um, they, 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 they do go wrong. But I think you know, there's, a, there's an innate willingness, I think, when you start up to make it work. What is of interest is to examine what causes the relationship to break down. And I have a very strong <laughs> view about leadership here. Um, the, the permanent secretary has the line management responsibility. The secretary of state carries the can for the department. Whatever happens in the department, you take responsibility. <coughs> and I think as the two, uh, the permanent secretary and the secretary of state, go through the good times and the bad times, but especially the bad times together, that will either cement or break the relationship apart. I, th I think when you start to criticize your civil servants, you're going to deliver a tough blow to their morale. Criticism should be kept indoors and dealt with privately publicly you take responsibility. Uh, well now, it's, it's just two o'clock, so we really ought to wind this up. Uh, one point, one theme that's come through, and I'm not going to attempt to summarize them all, is that the current system is not very well understood, and you only have to read <coughs> the debate that's been going on in the presses over the last few months to realize how true that is. I am full of hope that as a result of today's debate, there is more understanding here of what people's respective positions are and indeed what their drives for change might be. So thank you for your contribution to that. May I most of all thank the panel for three terrific contributions in their different ways to giving us a good lunchtime session. Thank you so much. <laughs>